Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. I want to welcome back to the program William Hoagland. He is uh, the historian and proprietor of Hoagland's Bad History newsletter on Substack, author of his most recent, The Hamilton Scheme, an epic tale of money and power in the American founding. Uh, William, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me back. Good to be here. Well, let's uh, before we we dig into uh, Hamilton and um, and uh, you know uh, I think much of what uh, people know about Hamilton these days uh, has to do with him not gonna uh, miss his shot or whatever it is. I did uh. not. I did not. I did not see the. I did not see the musical, but my daughter played yeah. it many many times. <laughs> um, what what drew you to Hamilton at, at this point in sort of the the work that you've been doing? Well, you know, I've been working on him for a long time, uh, actually. So the the moment is strange for me personally because the musical came along and the cultural explosion, I mean, you know, that you're referring to, uh, everybody, you know, was listening to it, not just listening to the soundtrack, but, you know, quoting the actual Hamilton. Um, got very interested in Hamilton. And um, so, you know, I had been working on him before, so it was strange and kind of, I don't know, earth-shaking for me in a different way when this phenomenon took off. And so I felt for a while like, well, my added, my Hamilton is kind of gone now. Like, what can I do? Like, you know, I was trying, but you know, you can't fight a, a cultural uh, tidal wave like the Hamilton musical. And I don't want to fight it. So, okay. But then I realized actually there's a potential for an opportunity here. If people are interested in Hamilton, well, there's more to him than that. And it's pretty interesting. In fact, it's super dramatic, I think. Uh, for me, more dramatic even than the musical. And so I just decided to uh, try to get that into a book, get that story told. All right. Let's start with, um, I mean, the, um, the, the, I guess the, the, the reputation that um, uh, Hamilton had was, you know, in, in terms of like him setting up the financial system of this country. Um, Tell us about the, his ideas about debt and why this was important to uh, founding the country and and how like it it almost sort of morphs into something. It, it starts off as sort of like a, a, a um, almost like a well, we it's good to have buy in to a project. But then like the ownership stakes start to become a problem, I think, is the way that this as it, it goes further down the line. Well, yeah, we often hear about the debt, the public debt of the United States, the war debt, because, of course, you know, to fight the revolution, the country had to borrow money. It's often framed as the foreign debt, and there was foreign debt. Uh, that's true. And it's also often framed as a, something that would be considered a problem by people like Hamilton, who then when he came in as Treasury Secretary would have to, like, get it under control, you know, fight it down, beat it back, uh, manage it, which he did have to do. He had to manage it. But his way of thinking about the debt is very different from seeing the debt as a problem that had to be fought down. It was more like an amazing opportunity for consolidating the country. But as you say, uh, the terms in which uh, the country would get consolidated around the debt were involved ownership stake. Yeah, like who, who were these lenders uh, that the country owed money to? And the answer is domestically, not the foreign debt, the domestic debt, which was what was so exciting to Hamilton actually, is it was a very small group of very rich people speculating in federal bonds. And the whole idea that Hamilton had really around the debt was to yoke the aims of that class, which he knew well, it was the class that had taken him in and made him who he was. Um, he was aware that their pursuit of wealth was just never ending, almost bottomless. And that he felt he could take that strong desire, that force um, and yoke it to great national aims by making that very influential, very rich class dependent on and interrelated with the federal government rather than with the individual state governments. And um, uh, the it, it it ended up, uh, I mean, he he wanted them, um, uh, I guess, like sort of their their fates uh, intertwined with the countries. He also wanted them to have sort of uh, it was sort of almost like a mutual power type of, uh, of situation, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to people like Hamilton, he wasn't alone in this. The class of people who should be running things 
were sort of, I don't know, the richest, best educated, most ambitious people, which was a small group of people compared to the vast majority of people in the country. So yes, this whole idea was to heavily privilege that small class of wealthy people um, and consolidate American power that way to make, you know, make, not just make it a country, but make it a, ultimately his hope was that it would be a global, you know, competitor with other, with other empires like that Britain. So that does, you know, it's, so it's an anti-democratic vision. I mean, it's the thing. It's, it's not just undemocratic or they aren't, they haven't caught up with democracy yet or something. No, it's, it's explicitly anti-democratic. Where, where does it fit in the context of like, uh, of being anti-democratic, but also, um, like, uh, in, in terms of the monarchy? I mean, I, I, I've interviewed, uh, people who, who, um, uh, two professors and the book escapes me now, but it was, uh, I think it was the anti-oligarchic constitution or something uh, to that effect. And the idea that in, in many respects, the constitution as written is anti-oligarchic, but at that time, the oligarchy was not necessarily rich people, but it was like the king, um, like somebody who was rich and didn't necessarily deserve the money or something to that effect. I mean, where does he fit within that context? Well, it really, as you sort of point out, it depends what you mean by oligarchy in a way, because it depends who the oligarchy is. But I mean, um, yeah, I, well, he fits this way for me. I mean, the chapter in my book called The Hamilton Constitution kind of goes against, and you know, this is gonna be somewhat counterintuitive deliberately to a lot of people who know some of the history because at the Constitutional Convention, Hamilton, A, he, didn't, he wasn't there all the time. He didn't speak much. When he spoke, he sort of bothered, but what he was saying bothered people there. So a lot of people don't see the Constitution as Hamiltonian exactly. Some of his biographers almost could have go, well, this wasn't his finest hour, let's just move on. I actually think the opposite. I think he was his, his way of thinking is what got them into the room in the first place. And that what they came out with at the other end was um, a constitution that did indeed have the mechanisms built in. And this was the fundamental reason he, he thought they should have the constitution built to create what was effectively an American oligarchy around these rich uh, bondholders of, of federal debt. And I'll, I'll add to that that actually, the federal bondholders themselves very explicitly in petitions and other primary sources pretty much say like, this is why we have the constitution. You've got to make us whole, you know, this is what the constitution's for. And I think this way of looking at the constitution while possibly you know, distressing in some ways, um, maybe, maybe because it's distressing has been really largely overlooked in public history. And, and, and people should remember, too, at that time, you know, senators were not uh, elected uh, directly. I mean, there was um, there the, the it was set up really to protect these interests. And then juxtapose that with like sort of our perspective of the Federalist Papers, which were, um, you know, which were which we now take as I think from your estimation as far more um, relevant to understanding the constitution than they were deployed to be in the first place. Yeah, it's, it's, they've had a weird history because now, I mean, judges look to this as an authority um, in, in court findings and so forth about how the constitution's supposed to work. They really, the, the, what we call the Federalist Papers was a series of essays, op-eds really, you could call them, I guess, in which Hamilton, Madison, and John Jay were trying to persuade the, the voters of New York to vote for representatives and, and for ratification of the Constitution. Um, and when you read them kind of th in the context, I don't know, that I that I have come to, um, they're, they're interesting pieces of work and some of them have some relevance, of course. But actually some of the things they're saying in there are, um, they, first of all, they're not always what they really think. They're trying to persuade people like, no, this Constitution's great. Like they're raising fears and saying the Constitution's the solution to your fear. Or raising issues or, or raising interests and saying the Constitution will satisfy your interests. So they're pitching really hard in these essays. Um, and then, you know, kind of, I don't know if this is relevant either, but like they didn't really have much impact on ratification in New York. Uh, that was done, you know, that was done through other means. So at the time, no, I don't think they had the relevance that we've given them since. Did they miss it? When you say they didn't have much impact in terms of the ratification, 
did they just misunderstand the moment or was it just the, the we're going to pu- pump this stuff out? I mean, it wasn't meant to be commentary as much as it was a sales pitch, right? I mean, so yeah. um, uh, what did they miscalculate in terms of its uh, efficacy in that regard? Well, it seems that, I mean, you know, it was, it was, it ended up being very close, but at first, um, at first the, uh, the anti-federalists had a, had a majority. And when you, you read the scholarship on this, it seems to me that what really went on to, to get that anti-federalist majority to be, to no longer be a majority had a lot to do with both with two things. One kind of, you know, the usual backroom sort of hidden kind of machinations among politicians, but also the fact that at some point it just wasn't going to be realistic as much as New York could sort of hold out and say, we don't want to join this. Uh, it was already largely fait accompli. The other states, enough other states had joined. And you can, in the end, it's sort of like, well, okay, we really have no choice, no no practical choice here. What we can do is hold out for amendments post-ratification, which is, of course, what a bunch of the states did. And so there were then the amendments, but they were post-ratification. So, so would it be fair to say that Hamilton like effectively leveraged these debts to get these wealthy capitalist types to buy into kind of a nationalistic project um, in ways that maybe they wouldn't have if the anti-federalist vision um, won out, but it also involved a lot of anti-democracy in the way that it, it formed itself? Yeah, I think that's totally fair to say. And the anti-democracy piece... Um, becomes a pretty dramatic part of the story because um, it isn't just like in the, so in the process, we have to you know, give up on democracy. It was all, it was a fairly uh, assertive anti-democracy agenda coming from Hamilton. And at the same time, there were actually people, I mean, I guess this is one of the things that's, again, I don't think really well understood is like, because we could say, well, they weren't into democracy. And it's like, well, no, they weren't. But people then say, well, but who was at the time, really? I mean, that seems anachronistic to expect anybody to be into democracy at the time. And that's just not true. It's precisely anachronistic to leave out the people who were fervently in favor of greater democracy. Let's just put it that way. Uh, And these were the people, even though they're largely left out of, of our discourse, these were the people that Hamilton was most concertedly trying to put down throughout his career. Uh, let's talk about those people. I mean, um, and maybe we see it uh, in the context of, of Shays Rebellion and then ultimately Whiskey Rebellion, which I know you've written about in the past and, and write about here, too. Um, what? what uh, let's just start with uh, Shays Rebellion, just because I grew up in Worcester, Mass. And so I, I have a natural affinity to that one. But I mean, where 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 does that fit? And And, and when... When we when we talk about people who are interested in democracy at that time, like what did that mean to them? Yeah, I mean, that second part, we should talk about Shays Rebellion because it fits right in here. Um, but uh, that second part of that of that issue you raise, um, what it meant to them as a, and it was a movement. It was a movement and it was an interstate movement, not organized as well as it might have been sort of chaotic at times, spasmodic. It was the people it was it was a group of people. Basically, it was white men left out of the process, which is to say, really, in most places, the majority of white men, because if you didn't if you didn't have a certain amount of um, property, you didn't vote. And if you didn't have even more property than that, you couldn't stand for office. And so there was a concerted movement. I, I think of it as a labor movement, really, on behalf of the majority that was doing all the real, you know, kind of labor work, which would include in those days, you know, small, small subsistence farming and artisan shops and so forth. And, ten- and tenants, many, many tenants, because we often have this idea that everybody had their own little piece of land back then, but they didn't at all. So this kind of, I don't know, motley group of people wanted to break the tie. And this is a pretty radical thing to want to do at the time, break the tie between property ownership and, I don't know, rights, basically, um, political rights. And so while it was not democracy either, in a lot of the ways we might want to think about democracy. Um, I don't, they weren't pushing for rights for women, most of them, and people of color and so forth, although some were abolitionists and some weren't, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't perfectly fit our ideas about what democracy ought to be. The radical thing about this kind of uh, founding era labor movement was that they wanted to snip, snip the cord that had long yoked the idea of rights 
in the minds of the elite American revolutionaries anyway, to property ownership. So that's kind of a long answer to the second part about who were these people and what did well, they Well, no, but I like that answer, and I, and I want to even expand on it more because I'm curious as to where, when we talk about, I mean, if you have a burgeoning movement that wants to untether, um, um, they want to make, they want to untether the relationship between having to hold property and having rights in society to dictate the outcome of society, not not dictate it, but to participate really mm-hmm. in the outcome of society. Right. What, what, where do we get like the, um, um, the concept of, of property rights? Like when, when we see property rights referenced in our founding documents, is that a defensive posture or a, I mean, uh, you know, in the, uh, is it a, uh, a, a positive right or a negative right that we're reading when it, we see it in that way? Right. Well, I mean, in terms of defensiveness, I think frequently it is defensive in the sense that, that uh, the, the traditional elite governing elites of the day and across party lines or partisan lines, they kind of got together on this at the Constitutional Convention. Then trouble came among them. But they got together on this issue ultimately, which is that, um, yeah, that, that property rights need to be defended from what they saw. And you can read the letters where they write to each other in a state of high anxiety. Um, they saw the idea that this democracy movement, this labor movement was going to just take over the individual states and start, I mean, literally Henry Knox writes to George Washington. Henry Knox had been the secretary of, of war for the, uh, Constitu- for the Continental Congress and, 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 uh, and Washington's artillery general and so forth. Um, he writes to Washington saying that, you know, they're going to take over. They believe that since they fought the war, which of course had been the, the normal people had been the foot soldiers in the war. They think because of that, that what, that they should, that all property should be divided equally and every, everyone should have a fair share. And this has to be stopped. And Washington was like, yeah, this is a big moment. We've got to stop this. So um, that property rights thing is, is a, it was a tenant a long-standing tenet of what rights were supposed to be based on, according to this, the, the people who, who led the revolution, famous people. And at the same time, when they're making sure to, to uh, shore up property rights, yeah, it is defensive. It's defensive against what they saw as a movement that was going to take them away. Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about uh, Shay's Rebellion. Um, yeah, in that context, yeah, that's that's the context in which it occurred right there. I think a lot of people know that it was one of the uh, instigating factors in calling the Constitutional Convention, that you had this uprising in Massachusetts of ordinary people, poor farmers, um, just not only not paying their taxes because they couldn't afford to, uh, there was an incredibly regressive tax situation in Massachusetts. And here's the place where it connects with the debt. Um, the idea was Massachusetts decided we're going to we're going to fund the debt ourselves, pay off the, the rich people of Massachusetts and others throughout the country who had bought Massachusetts bonds. And they instituted taxes to do this that came down heavily on people who had no bonds, never would have had a bond in their lives. And they couldn't pay. And they had just come back from the war. These are revolutionary foot soldiers who just come back from the war and some lower officers. And they rose up. But what they rose up about, which is so rarely kind of put into the center of their of their vision, is against this kind of regressive finance policy. Um, That's what they were fighting against. And that's what was so terrifying to the traditional elites around the country about the Shays Rebellion, because they started shutting down, you know, they were marching in in formation, shutting down debt courts, not letting debt, uh, debt cases get prosecuted. And then they went further and they actually marched on the federal armory, uh, the Continental Congress's armory at Springfield. Um, So this was like, uh, there's two things there. One is that kind of movement had gone on before the revolution too, in the North Carolina regulation and other uprisings like it. But this is post-revolution and coming out of the revolution, you get the idea, regular people are saying, we can't have this taxation without representation. This is what was supposed to be fought for. This is what we supposedly won and sacrificed for. And now we still can't vote in Massachusetts and we have regressive taxes. So to them, it was a moral call for, you know, an appeal to the morals of the very revolution itself. And uh, governing elites are like, oh, this isn't just rioting anymore. These are people who've been trained in warfare. 
They, right. they thought they knew what they were fighting for. And now they're shutting down government in Massachusetts and Massachusetts can't do much about it. And, and, and was the perspective of these uh, farmers or, or in this sort of burgeoning movement that why aren't the big landowners paying a bigger share? Like, why isn't not just our, why are we being taxed, but why is it that our taxation is not progressive? Like mm. we, yeah, like why it, it, it's almost as like, it's you're making a profit on the bonds that you lent the country and you're getting the profits of the outcome of this war. And you're not going to be paying like a little bit more for all of this process uh, to go forward. Yeah, that's it. It's just, you know, it's the way you put it. It's perfect because that's, again, it's often poorly understood. It's people think, oh, they were anti-tax. Like the Shazite rebels were anti-tax. Later, the whiskey rebels are often uh, painted as being anti-tax, like the first real tax revolt. Well, it was a tax revolt, but they were explicit about what they believed. And if you read what they said in their petitions and other places, no, they were not anti-tax. They actually said things like, we are anti, I, I can't perfectly quote it right now, but I can paraphrase it. I mean, anti-taxes that don't operate in proportion to property. In other words, progressively. And some of their leaders, Herman Husband is one, um, not a well-known name, but he should be, uh, who called for progressive taxation and many other very advanced ideas that didn't come up until later in, in real life. Let's move to the Whiskey uh, Rebellion, and let's also talk about uh, Herman Husband and um, and then ultimately, um, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, Albert Gallatin. And um, is it, uh, uh, I can't read my writing now, Fickley, uh, uh, Finkley. Uh, William uh, Finley, maybe? Finley, Finley. yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Congressman. Uh, mm -hmm. who were uh, critics of, of Hamilton. And, and Herman Husband seems like a pretty good guy, uh, particularly for that era. Pretty amazing guy. I mean, why people don't know more about him, I don't know. And I've been trying to fix that. And I'm still trying to fix it. And I have no idea if it'll work. But Herman Husband was just, a, like so many of the leaders of this movement, actually, they were idiosyncratic. You know, they weren't like all lockstep. Husband was a, was a I mean, compared to Paine, who was an, Thomas Paine, who was another leader, Payne was kind of a hyper rationalist. Husband was an evangelical Christian. He had moved from sect to sect and um, church to church, finally thrown out of the Quaker meeting because he was just so his own person, had his own vision. He had literal visions, like he actually saw visions the way, say, William Blake did or Joan of Arc hearing voices. So a lot of people in the governing elites, especially, uh, not surprising, they called him like the madman of the Alleghenies where he lived. But ordinary people elected him to office repeatedly. And the amazing thing about Husband really is that what he was envisioning in this sort of surprising and unusual way were things that later you could call social security, progressive taxation, um, all kinds of measures that, that, and he wanted them to come from government. They he thought these should be constitutionally built into a new American government. He wasn't an anti-federalist, for example. He wasn't against consolidating the government as a single nation, neither was Paine. It was that they believed each in their own way that like a right of national citizenship should entitle you to certain things. That's how that should work. And those things are things that didn't come to this country until the New Deal in most cases, and sometimes after that in the great society, and maybe some haven't come at all. But so, you know, he had this vision in the 1780s 1770s, 1780s, and 1790s that made him seem crazy. And I've sometimes thought, well, if you could envision the New Deal in the late 18th century, maybe you just have to be a bit crazy. Well, yeah. Where does, where does that idea come from at that time? Well, I mean, for him, you know, if you asked him, he'd tell you it came straight from Scripture. He interpreted biblical Scripture to be giving instructions basically for how to create what he called good government that that this was the coded message of the prophecies of daniel for one was one of his major books he, he liked other ones too but daniel he spent his life on and to him the book of daniel is a coded message to the united states for how to set up its government in, in very 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 progressive terms that's not where Paine got his ideas. Paine, Paine was an eight. Uh, uh, I don't know. Paine had his own kind of religious thing, but he was super rational. So that's what I mean by idiosyncratic. Like the leaders were not all come, getting to, coming from the same place, but they kind of husband and came and Paine came to a kind of 
pro-labor welfare state. And they got their ideas from all kinds of places. Um, uh, let's talk about the, the whiskey rebellion, uh, takes place in, uh, Western Pennsylvania, um, in the 1790s. That's right. Early yeah. 1790s. Yeah. yeah. First half of the 1790s, it kind of built up to a climax in 94. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, what, uh, it's also, uh, how is it different from Shay's rebellion, uh, in, in that respect? Well, it's very different in one way. And the context for this is, is that. What happened in between, um, you know, in a way, I'm like the North Carol Carolina regulation before the revolution, then comes the revolution, which complicates things so that the Shays Rebellion is different from earlier ones. Now there's another in-between state, which is the formation of the national government, which didn't exist during the Shays Rebellion and actually was a spur to getting everybody into the room to create the national government. Now the national government's created, and not only is the government created, but Hamilton um, you know, our guy Hamilton is now like in charge of all finance and he's bringing about his policies, everything he's been trying to do. Now he gets to do. So the Whiskey Rebellion is a response to that, a strong reaction against, you know, it's called the Whiskey Rebellion uh, because it was a tax on whiskey that was particularly the present issue. But the fact is it was a, an attack on all of Hamilton's entire system. Um, for how to do finance in the country in this regressive way we've been talking about. So, yeah, I mean, whiskey, you know, I called my first book The Whiskey Rebellion because it's a really good title and it's just like, oh, whiskey and rebellion, cool. It was, you know, whiskey's involved, but actually it really was a, a, a coherent descent from and then attack on the federal government in its Hamiltonian iteration. It's amazing how much liquor uh, dominates uh, the sort of <laughs> our society mm -hmm. in in uh, as a sort of fundamental tentpole um, through like the early like early 1900s. Right. I mean, that's where yeah. I mean, all of our taxation, Johnny Appleseed. I mean, all of it seems to be uh, liquor based in some well, fashion. Yeah. You know, there was a lot of drinking going on all the time back then. Um, what we might think of these people as, you know, if we would think of them as, you know, they lived in the past, they were sort of more uptight than us or whatever. Uh, it's really, again, a weird way to look at it because certainly in the area of alcohol, I mean, going way back to before this time, sometimes it was the only safe thing you could drink when the water well, that, was bad, right? I mean, my understanding, that's what Johnny Appleseed was up to. It's yeah. just like, we're going to plant these trees. You're going to make hard cider and you'll always have something to drink, not right like adds an alcoholic thing, but just something that's safe. Right. Although, you know, the alcoholic thing adds something to well, it. So it doesn't there was hurt, this weird, I guess. Right, yeah. exactly. There was this weird dynamic there, actually. But, uh, you know, in the Whiskey Rebellion, at times, um, the Eastern elites were like, oh, they're just, you know, they're just drunk. They're just drinking whiskey. They don't want to pay tax on it. Hamilton's thing was like, if they don't want to pay tax on the whiskey, they should just cut down, you know, on their ex obviously mm. excessive drinking. This is the fascinating thing to me is that the real market for the Western whiskey was in the East. Uh, and the whole thing was to, you could, you could, if you wanted to reduce very heavy grain, which cost a lot to truck over the mountains to the East, you could reduce it to whiskey and whiskey had value like money. I mean, it was just going to be valuable somewhere down the line. Someone's going to pay a lot of money for good whiskey because everyone in the East was drinking it too. Inclu and, you know, and the George Washington's of the world drank, um, they drank wine. They, they, they were all drinking kind of a lot all the time seems um the, just i mean w when you break down the sort of like three i think you 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 sort of outline three sort of like uh forces that are working to to shape this uh to shape what the country is ultimately going to become the the continentalists the state sovereigntists and and then just sort of like the idea of democracy and if democracy is represented by like what we see in these rebellions uh, and this sort of burgeoning movement of like, hey, um, the people who have all the rights, maybe they should be paying a little bit more in uh, in terms of taxes. Um, and, and they have these rights, obviously, because of their property and whatnot. Um, what, what, just I'm a little bit unclear on the continentalist versus the state sovereigntist. What, what is what's the dynamic there and who, who represents that? Well, early on, you know, in the Continental Congress during the revolution, uh, it wasn't it wasn't clear at all. It wasn't a majority opinion necessarily at all 
or a, a consensus opinion, I guess I should say that um, that the country was being that the country was going to become a nation, have a national government. The Continental Congress really was not a national government. It was a represent representative government representing state legislatures, not people. Um, so it acted on people indirectly through the state legislatures, but it was not a national government operating again on all citizens throughout the country. Hamilton wanted that. And he called it continentalism, and he was by no means alone. Washington wanted it. His his father, Hamilton's father-in-law, Schuyler, wanted it. John Jay, uh, James Madison at that time was on Hamilton's side. There were a lot of people who wanted it, um, and then there were a lot of people who thought, "No, we've, we're fighting. We're fighting Britain because they violated our state legislature's powers. Why would we give up those powers now to a national government?" So within the governing elite, you have this absolute conflict, which later on becomes kind of like the Federalists versus the Anti-Federalists. And after that, it becomes, and you know, sometimes it's seen as the Jeffersonians versus the Hamiltonians. Um, and then I'm saying, and, and we frequently, we look at the whole country's history and sort of the psychology of the country. And we say, oh, it's basically Hamilton versus Jefferson. That's been our sort of dilemma throughout the history, Hamiltonians versus Jeffersonians. I'm kind of saying, yeah, there's that. But there's this third force that nobody wants to talk about, which represents the majority of free laboring people in the country. Uh, maybe you might call it the white working class of the day, that movement I was just talking about, um, which actually obsessed Hamilton and compelled his attention because he wanted to crush it. So I'm really trying to say that it's not a binary. There's really three forces. There's two forces in the governing elite that are at each other's throats. And then there's a third force that they each of those two governing elite forces have a kind of a funky relationship with. And that's kind of what I'm tracing. Do those two forces within the elite, do they have a different ideological perspective or are all three on some level? These are, this is just a, when you, when, when you're at the beginning of a country, is it far more uh, fights between sort of like material stakes uh, than some type of ideological ones? That's a really key you know, issue. I mean, yes, there was ideological difference, certainly among the continentalist and state sovereignist points of view, the people who became the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, um, the Jeffersonians and the Hamiltonians, major ideological um, differences. But it's also interesting to look at like when, say, James Madison breaks with Hamilton, goes up against him uh, once Hamilton is Treasury Secretary. Uh, they've, they've worked together on bringing about the Constitution. But then they break up and it's pretty it's pretty painful um and madison goes after the central bank or the, the national bank i should call it that hamilton feels is critically important to bringing about all the things that he got into he, he thought were important about the constitution madison calls it unconstitutional that's an ideological argument i mean it's 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 fundamental it's like it's not just madison's not saying i hate banking he's saying it's unconstitutional for there to be a national bank and Hamilton's like, what? No, it's not. So that's that's a powerful ideological conflict. But it's really interesting to see that Madison also was representing, you know, Virginians, people from the South who didn't like national banking because they actually still wanted to remain private lenders and they didn't want competition from a national bank. So there's a material interest of, of great importance to the people who also had the ide ideology against the bank. So I think that you get these material interests mixed with material interests, and it's very hard to extricate one from another right. throughout the whole period. Well, and what from uh, from what would have been the ideological uh, uh, basis, one way or another, for saying that there should be a uh, a government bank or not a government bank, a federal government, uh, a federal central bank that was not independent, let's say. Well, Hamilton's point of view would have been that uh, in the Constitution, uh, if there are if there are things that should be done, like collect taxes and pay interest on bonds and all the things that, you know, the federal government is empowered to do, then whatever means you need to whatever systems you need to create to enable that are constitute are not unconstitutional. So they're constitutional. Um, and Madison's idea was nothing. Suddenly his idea became is what happened. I mean, his idea hadn't been this before, but suddenly his idea became anything not explicit, any power not explicitly enumerated in the document is unconstitutional. Uh, the necessary and proper clause, which is what Hamilton was relying on, does not mean you can just do anything you want. 
I don't think it's necessary necessarily to have like a, a bank in order to be able to collect taxes. So it's not covered. And so it, so then it becomes prohibited in his ideology. And, you know, we live with this. That was a, an amazing moment because Hamilton didn't even see that coming because ha Madison had never taken this position before. He'd always taken the opposite position. But when he turned politically against Hamilton, he put forth a constitutional theory that we still take seriously today, even though later when Madison became president, he supported rechartering the bank and backed off all that. So again, where do politics, you know, partisan politics, material interests and ideology come together? It's like, it's all balled up, you know, and it's really hard to sort out. Madison of that moment, I think, would uh, find some uh, solace with uh, uh, probably like Gorsuch and um, <laughs> and, and uh, maybe, you know, uh, Clarence Thomas uh, these days in terms of like uh, the federal government doing anything in service of anything. Yeah. I mean, this whole idea that, that is taken seriously by many people that there, that there is a legitimate ide ideology around, um, you know, I mean, of course, the federal government's power is limited. I mean, of course, we want power to be limited. But the idea that, I mean, early on, it was like the anti-federalists who had at first said, oh, this, this government's overpowered. It's overempowered. We can't ratify the Constitution. Suddenly, they changed their, their tack, and they said things that we do here today from people in high places that not, not as only is it not overly empowered, it can't do anything, um, which all happened like they turned on a dime, you know, really and did a 180 in uh, a few months to, to develop that ideology, which people stand on to this day. Um, and then uh, Albert Gallatin uh, comes in following uh, a Hamilton and basically goes on a project to undo uh, what Hamilton did. Um, was he doing this again? Was this in service of democracy or was it just in service of, I got a different bunch of uh, friends who are landowners? <laughs> Um, well, that's a really, again, a complicated uh, issue. So, right. So let, I mean, try to pull those things apart. Actually, I think Gallatin, um, he was kind of a centrist in certain ways. Like he came in with the Jeffersonians and he was a committed Jeffersonian and he was Jefferson's treasury secretary. And then he was Madison's treasury secretary. So he was treasury secretary longer than Hamilton because he was in two administrations and each of those administrations was two terms. He didn't go all the way to the end of Madison's second term. But or all the way through Madison's first term. I can't remember right now. I don't have my book in front of me. But yeah, he was in he was in two administrations and had a huge impact on the country. And his his job was I mean, Jefferson told him, OK, good, you got the job. Go in there today, dismantle everything Hamilton did. Just throw it out and build the right thing. And tell me everything he did wrong and all his mistakes and everything. And we're just going to throw it all out. Can't throw the bank out because it's got a longer charter, but everything else. And when the charter comes up, we'll get rid of that, too. Gallatin was not that extreme. He was a Jeffersonian, but he actually had a very interesting kind of middle position where he went into work at the Treasury office and was like, wow, you can't just shut this down. The whole country will fall apart. He had to go back and tell Jefferson, you know, like um, it's a house of cards. If you pull one piece of this out, the whole thing's going to fall apart. So what he did, because he was an incredibly patient person at a time when nobody else was, it seems to me. He sat there for years, year after year after year, staying in Washington, staying at his desk in the heat in the summer and humidity, smoking cigars and sitting at his desk and working to whittle down the public debt, not just throw it out, whittle it down, whittle it down, whittle it down. And the amazing thing, one of the amazing things is that that's the period where Jefferson, who had come in on this anti-tax, small government kind of deal, that's when, that's when he did the Louisiana Purchase, which had to be financed. And that's when they started having wars that had to be financed. And Gallatin sitting there managing this kind of Jeffersonian ideological extremism combined with Jefferson not doing Jeffersonian things, doing un-Jeffersonian things, and focusing on whittling down the debt, which took an incredible discipline. And he did very well for a long time. But his arc ends up being, to me, another one of the sort of tragic arcs of that period, because in the end, his own party, the Jeffersonians now called the Republicans, that his own party turned against him. Um, and so he ends up really unable to complete his tasks. And he's just dealing with, you know, they want to have the war of 1812, but they don't want to pay for it. And he's like, if you want to have this war, 
you know, you've got to pay for it, which means we need taxes, which means we need to do the Hamiltonian type of things. And they're like, oh, he's a Hamiltonian. You know, he was stuck uh, in the end. So it's a, another career that has an arc that's not always happy, but I think really dramatic and really interesting. Okay. So lastly, uh, Hamil uh, Hamilton's legacy, like where do we see that today outside of, uh, you know, uh, the Broadway musical? <laughs> You know, the funny thing is that the Broadway musical, as unpredictable as it was and as impactful and so forth as it was, come seeming to come out of nowhere, was really the cherry on top, in a way, of a long period of building up Hamilton's reputation again in policy circles, government, federal government policy circles in the 19, well, the 1990s during the Clinton administration. Uh, Robert Rubin and people like that in Clinton's administration were... They found inspiration in Hamilton. The George W. Bush administration, uh, his tr secretary, Treasury Paulson, was a, uh, was a Hamilton fan. And then that crosses over during the financial crisis in 2008 when Obama comes in. And the, the incoming Obama administration starts working with the outgoing uh, Bush administration to wrestle with the financial crisis. And Hamilton was a huge influence on them, a huge impact on them. They lionized this, this particular founder. What part uh, of it so was that's, it? So that's that, was it the regressive nature of Hamilton, uh, Hamiltonian policies? I mean, what was it or just the veneration of finance? They wouldn't call it the regressive nature. Um, and I don't know that their understanding of Hamilton was the same as mine. So, no, but they really they the, the veneration was for the bailout for like he was Mr. Bailout. Timothy Geithner referred to Hamilton as Mr. Bailout. Um, he was the. And so how do you how do you save a financial system? How do you heroically save a financial system? And then, you know, was the interest in making sure that every small person, ordinary person thrown out of their home, make them whole? Or was the thing to save, you know, to save the, make sure the companies that are too big to fail don't fail. Right. It's and the so you do, you do get it. Yeah. It's the centering of finance as a first order, um, uh, like an end, like a, a means in and of itself versus uh, or i should i should say an ends in and of itself versus a means to embedder people on some level yeah i mean the rationale would be the whole country's going to fall apart there's not going to be milk on the shelves next week if you don't do this which paulson kept coming into congress and saying actually and then there was milk on the shelves the next week and the congressmen are like you told us there was gonna be no milk on the shelves if we don't do what you say so you know they they, they don't they, i don't think they think of it as like we don't care about ordinary people we just care about finance as its own self-generating engine. I think they think it's good for the country, obviously. Well, but they think it, that, but, but like, I'm, I guess like the, the starkest difference to me is do we pay off the banks for their bad, with their bad loans and say, and guys do us a favor, make it easy on the homeowners, or do we pay off the homeowners who have a obligation to pay, to give that money to the banks mm. Like you ensure that you bail out the homeowner, they're much more likely to pay off the banks than by bailing out the banks are much more likely to offer relief to the homeowners because they still have their primary objective, which is to make as much money as possible from these transactions. And that's in fact what happened. And I wonder if like if you, I don't think you ever, I think they thought like we need to protect the financial system to save the country, but their veneration of the financial system was so high that like if there's any margin of error we got to get that money in the yeah. banks first as opposed to making because fdr did sort of the opposite mm -hmm. right yeah, i mean right. so yeah. it's, it's sort of just like an ideological perspective on how important finance is and at the end of the day it's like they're supposed to be there to service the homeowners on some level not vice versa yeah and all the people we're talking about came from the finance world and went back to the finance world. Yeah. And so it's gonna obviously gonna affect their, their worldview. And yeah, I mean, the Democratic Party abandoned that whole FDRian thing, you know, long before really. And when Obama came in, he'd already given a speech to the Hamilton Project of Brookings that was set up by Robert Rubin, being very positive, uh, a very well-received speech by the bankers and Wall Street people he was talking to, um, being very positive about Wall Street and, ba and big banking as the, you know, the, the fundamental structure, you know, underlying structure of how things work in the country.
So it shouldn't have been a huge surprise, although I think to some people it was the position that the administration took on bailing, how they how they bailed out. Uh, William Hoagland, uh, the book is, um, oh, I have it, I uh, want to get the whole title, I've lost it here on my, shoot. I can, I can give you the whole title. Yes, <laughs> oh. please do. <laughs> it's the Hamilton Scheme, an epic tale, which is what, what it is, of money and power in the founding period. In the founding period? In the American yes. founding. In the American founding. And your uh, and your um, Substack's new letter is Hoagland's Bad History. We will put Correct. a link to both those at uh, Majority.fm and um, our YouTube and podcast description. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Good conversation. Thanks so much. Hey, folks, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and check out our daily show. We do it every day at 12 p.m. Eastern for about two and a half hours. We even take phone calls. You should check that out.